Grace and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Scott, and I'm glad you're here. Um, we had our first worship service this morning, and it was a beautiful service, but we had a technical challenge that did not allow the video to record uh, up to YouTube. So I'm going to do a um, abbreviated service today. It will be the scripture reading and the sermon. And then we had pre-recorded two songs. I'm going to have those uploaded separately. So it'll be a church service deconstructed, if you will. And I thank you for uh, your patience in that. Um, you know, we had just gotten brand new equipment before COVID started. And so the, the team in the back had learned it, but um, you know, really hadn't had an opportunity to put it into practice. Everything shut down and they had to relearn it for today. So um, we're getting there and we, we thank you for your patience in that and uh, we'll continue. So um, without further ado, the scripture reading this morning is Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, because you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For the Jewish people, it had been over a thousand years since the first covenant, the one God made with Noah and all creation, the covenant where God promised not to destroy the earth by a flood, the one where God hung a rainbow in the sky as a reminder of that binding covenant. It was a pact made between God and all creatures and all life on earth, a covenant that showed how much God loved the world he created. And the time since the covenant with Abraham, well, it's been a hundred years, hundreds of years. So many generations have come and gone since Abraham left his family, his birthright, and his land. And with faith alone, Abraham followed God's call on his life. So many generations born under the covenant of Abraham, a covenant that promised a land of their own for the Jews a land flowing with milk and honey and as many descendants as the stars. Descendants, the people who would be set apart as chosen by God and who would one day rule the land and be wise kings and leaders. And even since the Sinai covenant, the covenant contained underneath the Abraham covenant, the one the Hebrew people received at the fo foot of Mount Sinai some 500 years after Abraham walked earth, even that covenant is now hundreds of years old for the Israelites. The day they received the Sinai covenant was the day the chosen people, the people under Abraham's covenant, received the Ten Commandments, the rules, the just because from God that outlined what was expected of them to love God and to love their neighbor. Generations have come and gone since those covenants were given to the chosen people. Moses had long passed. The memory of Joshua leading the people into the land of Canaan with his military sense and ability was now only told in reverent whispers. The Hebrew people had long since settled down, sank their roots into the earth and grown. But the people would still share stories and remember the past because it was a narrative of how God blessed them and favored them. They were, after all, the chosen people. The Hebrews remembered how they grew and how leaders sprouted from their ranks, special leaders who would be called judges. These were wise people who led and directed the 12 tribes of Israel. The judges were people like Gideon, Deborah, and Samson, and they each successfully led people through trials from invading armies 
to marauding foreign tribes. But the Israelites, the chosen people, the people of the covenant, were so restless, and they wanted a king like the other nations had a king. So God gave them a king, first Saul, then David, then Solomon. And it was King Solomon who built the magnificent temple, the beautiful and ornate worship space for God, a permanent place for God to reside in the midst of his people, a space of beauty and holiness fitting for the God of all creation, a physical reminder that the people who worshiped in this holy space were truly a chosen people. After Solomon died, there was no consensus on who should be his successor, who should sit on the king's throne in Jerusalem. So the Hebrew nation, God's chosen people, it split into two. The northern tribes and the southern each picked their own king. Kings came and went in both the north and the south. Some were good, most not so much. And where the kings went, the people followed, until more and more of the people forgot what they were called to do. Instead of loving God and loving each other, they loved themselves and always put themselves first. So God sent prophets to the people, Malachi and Nahum, Micah and Isaiah, warning the people to change their selfish ways. The prophets warned the people and the kings again and again and reminded them that their primary calling was to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with their God. God expected them to not forget the widow, the orphan, and the vulnerable in their midst, or else. And the warnings from the prophets went unheeded. So in the time of unrepentant behavior and selfish hearts came the invaders to the Jerusalem came through the invaders of the Jerusalem land to those sacred lands of the chosen people. First came the Assyrians, a cruel and merciless country. They came and quickly conquered the northern kingdom. They shattered her, forever changing the lives of those covenant people who lived in the north. The southern kingdom made some deals, got some lucky breaks, and they were able to hold off the Assyrians. But in 587 BC, about a thousand years or more since Abraham first received the covenant for the Jewish people, the Babylonians were in power. And first, the Babylonians conquered all the lands of the Assyrians, which included where the northern kingdom of Israel used to be. Then they, the Babylonians, swept up the southern kingdom. They invaded Jerusalem, and they ransacked the temple built by Solomon so long ago, and they tore it down until the holy place was no more. No stone of the temple was left one on top of the other. The sacred decorations that had adorned the temple for years and years were taken back as a tribute to the king. The people, the chosen people, were taken by force by the Babylonians and scattered throughout the Babylonian kingdom. The last of the Jewish families are broken apart and the promised land is lost to the conquering armies. These are the people Jeremiah, the prophet, is speaking to. The people, the covenant, so many generations after Abraham and the time of Moses, the people who had freshly lost all they had, the people who had rested secure for so long in their identity as a chosen people, the people who forgot to love God and their neighbor and have now lost all their possessions and all things they hold dear, a people shell-shocked because the unthinkable just happened. This is who Jeremiah was speaking to. The people who thought they were untouchable because of that special relationship with God, well, they learned the hard way that all those prophetic warnings they received were real. God really did mean it when he said, change your ways or else. The or else came to the land and the people of Canaan. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. And if you read his words in the Bible, you see he bears witness to the pain and suffering of the people. He, throughout his ministry, calls the people to repent and then watches them being carted away, lives and identities destroyed. Jeremiah has one of the most beautiful call stories of the Bible. He records the Lord speaking to Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, 
I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. But if you keep reading a few verses later in chapter 1, it says, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The harvest has come and the people of the covenant have been plucked up and pulled down. The Israelites have been destroyed and overthrown when our passage was written. In the midst of their pain, confusion, disruption over their very lives and how it had turned out, Jeremiah tells the people of a new covenant. Jeremiah was speaking to people who had freshly lost their land, who were scattered and separated from their families. A people who lost their birthright and their identity. Jeremiah was speaking to a people who had literally lost everything. And in spite of their sinful past and a failure to follow the decrees of God, God speaks through the prophet Jeremiah and offers the words of a new covenant. We're going to make a new covenant, God says, not like the last one. This one will be written on the heart. This one will be life-altering and soul-changing. This one will be different than the last one, and no one will forget who is God. And we know that covenant Jeremiah was talking about is Jesus Christ, the one who came to everyone, not just the chosen people of Israel, the one who offered the inheritance of salvation to everyone. Under Christ, under the new covenant, there is no Gentile or Jew, and we too, you and I, we have been made heirs to the new promise of the new covenant. We are a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. This is our identity now. This is our inheritance. That through Christ we can have a relationship with God even more closely and intimately as the people of Abraham had for so many years. And to have that close relationship with God, we know that Christ came to take away the sins of the earth. That he had to bear those sins on his back while he hung on the cross for you and for me and everyone else. And because of that day, that Easter day, because of that moment, nothing is the same. But there's one more covenant, one more promise yet to be fulfilled, a new covenant. The new covenant for the people Jeremiah was speaking to was the coming of Christ. But the new one for us will be completed the day Christ comes again. When Christ will sit on the throne, when he will wipe away every tear, and there'll be no longer be pain or suffering, and death will forever lose its sting. We have been promised that new covenant, and it will come someday. We just don't know when. So while we wait for that return, we have a unique identity. We are the people of the in-between time. We are the people that stand between Christ coming the first time and the Christ returning in glory the second. We are the people that wait. But our time in waiting for the new covenant should not be spent idly. We have been called by Christ to go into the nations to make disciples and to baptize in his name. And we know that, Christ, that God isn't standing idly by either because he's stayed active in the past. We know God is continuing to work today and shape our future tomorrow. We know that he speaks to us in the present and calls us towards a better way to live. God places high expectations on the in-between people. And you know what they are? The exact same it was for the covenant people of Ben Beck. He expects us to love God and love each other, to do justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly, just like those Hebrew people so long ago. Our God is an active God, a present God, working with and through the in-between people to bring hope to the hopeless and peace to the restless. Which means, friends, that during COVID, during our time apart, while we waited together again, while we were lost and confused and displaced, our God was not idle. 
the active God we worship, the present God who became flesh and dwelt among us, was working and shaping and birthing something new. And now that we've reemerged from our time physically apart, that same God is entrusting us, his in-between people, regathered, to stand as midwives as he births new outpourings of love into the world. That same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the same God in Jesus, is calling you to proclaim the covenant of old, to say it was fulfilled, and to prepare for the new covenant of Christ's return. I'm excited to see what God has in store for us, what new ministries, what church will look like, what ways of proclaiming God's glory are we going to encounter, what new expressions of hope we as the church of God can bring to the world. And I hope you are too. The work is just beginning, brothers and sisters, and we have much to do before the master returns. Amen. So thanks again, friends. Um, we will always have something put up. Uh, it may not be exactly the same as a Sunday service uh, while we especially work out some of these technical challenges, but there will always be something. And God bless you and keep you. And look for those two recorded videos on Facebook too. They'll be on YouTube as well, but um, you can find them in both spots. So take care. God, God's blessing.